the state of our health, something we strive to improve and maintain, but sometimes inadvertently destroy. Universally, it's vitally important. The Germans have a universal word for it. Gesundheit. Coming up in today's edition, we see what life's like for the first generation of teens born with HIV through the eyes of one brave young man. And while the antiretroviral drugs are improving, people's prejudices have hardly changed at all. Since 57 BC, the ginseng root has been cultivated for its medicinal properties. It's thought to improve circulation, heal respiratory diseases and boost vitality. Now, researchers at Seoul National University claim the root may even suppress cancer. In Russia, a summer camp has been turned into a centre for the treatment of children with mental and physical disabilities. The camp, funded and run by a Moscow medical charity, uses animals in its unique rehabilitation program. And seeing the plaque that envelops the mind of Alzheimer's sufferers, a major breakthrough in diagnosing this ravaging illness. Patients are injected with a new chemical that seeks out the abnormal deposits in the brain. But first, Manu Dingra, the first of New York's burn victims from the World Trade Center attack to leave hospital and head home. With adrenaline spurring him on, Manu managed to walk down 83 flights. He couldn't walk again for several weeks. His long road to recovery began at Cornell Hospital, where he was treated for second and third degree burns to 35% of his body. The first thing doctors had to do was resuscitate him from shock. Next, he was given 40 litres of fluid and only then could they treat his pain. Manu's face had swollen to twice its normal size. But despite the many agonising months he's had to endure, the horrific burns have not beaten his spirit. Bill Smith suffered for years with a chronic leg ulcer due to a faulty vein. Like millions of other sufferers, he underwent painful cleanings and couldn't even do simple things with his family. Dermatologist Vincent Falanga uses a skin substitute called Apligraph to patch things up for patients like Bill. Made by Novartis, Apligraph is grown in a lab from discarded, sterilized foreskins. It's multi-layered and allows proper blood flow to grow in surrounding tissue. Incubated over four days, cells are fed nutrients until they multiply and all the skin layers are formed. It's then sent by overnight courier to doctors, packed in a nutrient-rich liquid. Doctors apply Apligraph directly to a wound and wrap the area with a compression bandage so that it will heal faster than conventional compression therapy alone. Apligraph is also being studied for use on other types of skin wounds, like those caused by diabetes, sickle cell anemia or burns. And speaking of skin, workers at Genomics Collaborative Incorporated in Cambridge, Massachusetts begin each day with a new delivery of blood and tissue samples. They never know how many they'll receive, but they must carefully process each sample immediately. Lab director Janice Williamson knows firsthand how important biological specimens are to research. She once spent two years tracking down tissue samples for a single research project. The founders of GCI understood this and decided to do something about it. Just three years later, they have more than 500,000 samples in their collection. The samples are mainly from people with cancer, heart disease and diabetes. Tissue is taken during surgeries to either remove a tumour or, in the case of heart disease, during bypass procedures. GCI has already begun using their own samples of DNA to search for genetic clues for common diseases. With hundreds of samples on each chip, they're helping others as well as themselves fund and potentially find future cures. And for the past four years, Diana Camposano has been on the painful road to recovery. 
She was badly injured during a 1997 Jerusalem suicide bombing. She's seen here being treated moments after the bomb ripped open her face. We're so used to scenes like these that we rarely comprehend the scale of the trauma that victims must cope with after the attack. It's taken eight painful surgeries to reconstruct bones, put pins in her skull, fix shattered eardrums, remove scar tissue, and even tattoo eyebrows back onto her face. Today, surgeons are trying to reduce scarring on Diana's forehead. There are some things that can't be fixed. The scarring from burns, her eyesight in one eye, and of course, the emotional distress. The bombing has left Diana suffering post-traumatic stress disorder, crippling anxiety and flashbacks. Her faith has been tested to the extreme, but ultimately, it has seen her through the tough times. According to Diana, despite it all, she's grateful to be alive. An important win for AIDS activists and pediatricians in South Africa. The High Court of Pretoria ruled that the government must provide the AIDS drug nevirapine to expectant mothers infected with HIV. Nevirapine can reduce HIV transmission from mother to child by up to 50%. South Africa's biggest activist group, Treatment Action Campaign, launched the suit after the South African government refused to administer the drug to pregnant women in public hospitals and clinics. Before the ruling, German drug company Boehringer Ingelheim, which makes nevirapine, offered it for free to developing countries for five years, but South Africa has not responded to the offer. The decision requires President Mbeki's government to formulate a plan for dispensing the drug. But the government argues that even if given the viropine, women will still transmit HIV to their children through breast milk. As many as 70,000 children are born HIV positive here each year. As HIV continues to spread across the globe, the cost of treating the deadly virus is becoming more prohibitive. The drug cocktail costs each patient $15,000 a year, more than the average person's wages in many developing countries. But US scientists report that it may be possible to cut a patient's dosage in half, reducing side effects and cutting costs. Researchers at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland, took a group of 10 patients and put them on intermittent treatment, seven days on drug therapy and seven days off for 68 weeks. They monitored the patient's viral load, or the level of HIV in the patient's blood after seven days off the treatment, and found the results were almost identical to patients who received continuous therapy. Cutting back on highly active antiretroviral therapy, or HART, can suppress the virus without creating resistant strains. Follow-up research will be conducted in the United States and Uganda in the hope that more drugs will be available to developing countries. The cost reduction could also prove critical in places like Africa, where more than 28 million people live with the virus. Justin Ligrecki is like any other 18-year-old, going to school, hanging out with friends and following the football. But Justin is also part of the first generation of teenagers born with HIV. Daily antiretrovirals make him feel sick, but it's the emotional battle that's the hardest like deciding to tell schoolmates about his HIV status. The fact that drugs are keeping teens alive well into adulthood has brought a new set of problems, like dating. Despite his HIV, Justin does have a steady girlfriend. Justin's adoptive mum, Melody, initially didn't want him to reveal his HIV status, knowing the bigotry he'd face. But instead of hiding, he set up a foundation to fight prejudice. No one knows how long this first generation of HIV-born babies will live, but Justin remains optimistic. For two decades, male condoms have been the primary tool for stopping the spread of HIV, but now researchers at Duke University in North Carolina are hoping to give women more control over HIV protection. While much attention is focused on time-consuming and expensive research, Dr. David Katz 
is leading research on a relatively simpler topical compound. It would kill the HIV virus on contact using microbiocides or what some would call magic bullets. Women whose cultures allow them little reproductive control would benefit most from the compound. Bioengineers want to develop a product that prevents infection but not pregnancy for fertility and religious reasons. It's also difficult to design a compound that works on all women all over the world. While research is still in early stages, Dr. Katz anticipates developing an HIV-killing cream, gel or foam that would one day be available over the counter. The ancient medicinal ginseng root is big business in Korea. Like cherished artwork, the older it gets, the more it costs. A 124-year-old root was recently auctioned off for a staggering 81,000 US dollars. The reason? Ginseng is thought to improve circulation, heal respiratory diseases, stave off colds, and boost vitality. Since 57 BC, the root has been cultivated for its medicinal properties. The Korea Ginseng Corporation produces 600 tons of red ginseng each year, 40% of which is exported. Ginseng derives its pharmacological property from a soap-like substance known as ginsenicide. Now researchers at Seoul National University claim the root could even suppress cancer. Such scientific accolades are only expected to boost sales and expectations even higher. The Bala Banovo summer camp, 100 kilometers west from Moscow, looks like thousands of other similar recreational sites where Russians with modest family incomes choose to send their children for summer holidays. But in a certain way, Bala Banovo camp is unique. The children who come to spend summer here are afflicted with various physical and mental disabilities such as cerebral palsy, autism, birth defects and mental disabilities. The camp is the summer base for a rehabilitation program called the Sunny World, developed by a group of Russian therapists and psychologists. The program involves a set of activities aimed at restoring children's physical and mental abilities with therapeutic horse riding being the major element. Therapeutic riding is the combination of physical therapy and equestrian techniques designed to build strength, coordination and, most importantly, self-esteem. The disabled children come to the camp with their families. Creating a familiar, friendly environment is one of the major elements of the program. The disabled kids interact with other children, with parents and instructors. They feel safe and happy and are willing to develop new skills and abilities. Katya, one of the children at the camp, developed cerebral palsy after a near drowning accident when she was just over a year old. Soon, it became clear that she wouldn't be able to walk or talk and her condition worsened. Her parents tried various medical options and treatments, but none had any effect. But now at the age of 14, just two years after joining the program, Katya's progress is evident. She can walk with some help. She tries talking and even started to learn a foreign language. Anton, her teacher, has been wheelchair bound all his life. Until joining the Sunny World program, he saw no light at the end of the tunnel and was suffering from severe bouts of depression. Now he's about to become a professional English teacher. Horse riding and animal therapy are not new. Similar methods have been applied in countries with well-established facilities for the disabled. But in Russia, centers like the sunny world may be the only hope for people with disabilities. About 200 children are currently attending the rehabilitation program. 
Despite the fact that summer camp forms an essential part of the program, only half of the children will make it to Balabanovo this year. Being a non-profit organization, the center can't afford to take all the children. In Russia, the disabled are still among the most deprived groups in society. They struggle to survive on minimal state social security, while the big cities rarely provide even the most basic facilities to care for their special needs. It's difficult to feel valued or appreciated in such a negative climate. Worst of all, parents live in fear that once they get too old or sick, their children will simply be institutionalized. That's why the program promotes maximum development so these children can someday live independent lives. And in an update to a story we brought you a few weeks ago, separated Siamese twins Ganga and Jamuna Shreshta are going home to Nepal. The rare babies underwent a 97-hour operation at Singapore General Hospital to separate their skulls. Jamuna, the stronger of the two, is learning to sit, while Ganga is gaining control of her head but has difficulty fixing her vision. The babies have not suffered any major strokes, brain swelling or infections, according to Professor Ho Lai Yun. Dozens of well-wishers, doctors and nurses were at the airport to bid them farewell. The twins and their family spent more than a year in Singapore and will return one day for more reconstructive surgery. After an emotional and thankful scene, the twins, their parents and grandparents left for Kathmandu. There they'll stay until the girls are healthy enough to return to their distant home village with only scant medical facilities. In stark contrast, a beacon of hope shines brightly in New York City. The Montefiore Children's Hospital offers the latest technology and surrounds to help youngsters deal with what can often be a scary experience. Movable computers allow healthcare providers to take notes more easily and ensure that proper medications are prescribed. The kid-friendly environment encourages patients to learn as well as heal. The lobby highlights the building blocks of life and each ward has a theme. The playrooms and ceilings keep the mood bright, while a mural with daisies and a farmyard hides scary-looking equipment. But for kids, it's all about that big TV. Best of all, any child is welcome at Montefiore. That's why it's situated in one of the roughest neighborhoods in New York. The high-tech wonder can turn an often terrifying experience into a time of wonder and exploration. Robert Schmidt is one of an estimated 500,000 Americans suffering from the neurodegenerative disorder, Parkinson's disease. Researchers say the disorder is caused by a combination of factors, both environmental and genetic. But new research in the latest issue of the Journal of the American Medical Association suggests a link between Parkinson's disease and another neurodegenerative disorder, Alzheimer's, via a protein called tau. Doctors at Duke University Medical Center believe they've found the connection on chromosome 17. Unlike the abnormal deposits of tau found in the brains of Alzheimer's patients, Vance says there's no abnormal tau in Parkinson's patients. Instead, researchers are finding a rather common form of protein that increases the susceptibility of developing late-onset Parkinson's disease. Duke researchers have also discovered five new genes linked to Parkinson's disease and hope the latest discoveries will bring them one step closer to finding a cure for the debilitating disease. Scientists at the University of California have developed a new way to detect changes in the brain before symptoms of the devastating disease begin. They believe it will revolutionize the way Alzheimer's patients are treated. During testing, a patient is injected with a new chemical which seeks out abnormal deposits in the brain. 
The patient then enters a PET scanner which shows where the chemical has accumulated. The technique is still undergoing clinical trials, but the potential benefits for Alzheimer's sufferers are huge. Dementia-related diseases affect more than 30% of people over the age of 80. Doctors hope that this breakthrough will lead to new forms of treatment and potentially even a cure. And while we're on the subject of aging, could a simple pill help men go through the infamous midlife crisis? Some doctors now say the midlife change is caused by dropping levels of the male hormone testosterone. This would mean that men go through their own form of menopause, called andropause. Some doctors offer patients testosterone replacement therapy to fight the symptoms of andropause, such as mood swings and osteoporosis. However, other doctors, like psychiatrist Dr. Thomas Wise, say that andropause is not a biological stage of life like menopause, but rather a psychological phase. Testosterone levels drop in men starting as early as age 30 and by age 70 can be half the level found in young men. The testosterone drop is blamed for what was once thought of as normal aging. Muscle weakness, sexual dysfunction, weight gain, fatigue and even high cholesterol. Dr. Wise says that aging is a fact of life, one that may not be alleviated with a simple drug treatment. Rather, he prescribes regular checkups, a healthy diet, and exercise. They say it's never too late to learn a new trick. And Robert Van Cleve is living proof. At 77, he's become a bona fide surfer. Web surfer, that is. Research has shown that isolation and consequently depression are high factors in elderly mortality rates. Many nursing homes are broadening their patients' horizons by getting them online to research healthcare or chat with other internet junkies. Special keyboards are easy to read and easy to use, building confidence and alleviating fears. Robert researched angiograms before he underwent one. He also 